We are back in this thing, okay? And we are covering ground that has not been covered, okay? We're going to talk about how Jesus was saved. We believe Jesus was saved, that he did not die on the cross, okay? So we're going to pick back up, and we're going to talk about the controversy on who carried Jesus' cross. This is going to be Matthew 27, 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Now, according to the gospel of Matthew, he is saying Simon carried the cross. Now we're going to go to Mark 15, 21. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Speaking of Jesus, okay? So now we're going to go to Luke. This is going to be Luke 23, 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him, they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So Luke, Mark, and Matthew all agree that a man named Simon Carry Jesus' cross. But now let's go to John 19, 16, and 17. Then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So John is saying Jesus carried the cross. Which one carried his cross? Because these accounts both can't be true. Okay, they both can't be true. Now, I've heard Christians literally say, well, he helped Jesus carry his cross. That's not in the scripture. That's your own words. According to the Bible, Simon carried it and Jesus carried his own cross. Which one is true? Because they both can't be true. Now, I'm going to read the Wikipedia of the Gospel of Basilides, okay? The Gospel of Basilides is the title given to a reputed text within the New Testament Apocrypha, which is reported in the middle of the third century as then circulating amongst the followers of Basilides, a leading theologian of Gnostic tendencies who had taught in Alexandria in the second quarter of the second century. Basilides' teachings were condemned as heretical by Irenaeus of Lyons. This is 130 to 200 CE. And by Hippolytus, of Rome, this is 170 to 236 CE. Although they had been evaluated more positively by Clement of Alexandria, this is 150 to 215 CE. So there was a mixture. There were some people who thought it was heretical, but there was others who believed it to be positive. There is, however, no agreement amongst Irenaeus, Hippolytus, or Clement as to Basilides' specific theological opinions, while none of the three report a gospel in the name of Basilides. So according to some Gnostic traditions, Simon of Cyrene, by mistaken identity, suffered the events leading up to the crucifixion. This is the story presented in the second trustus of the great set. Although it is unclear whether Simon or another actually died on the cross. So y'all look, 
there was a story that Simon carried it or another. And when we looked at the gospel accounts, they don't match. One say Jesus carried his own cross and the other say Simon carried his own cross. Now we're going to keep going. I want to talk about the famous gospel of Barnabas, okay? And it says that Judas died in Jesus' place, okay? The gospel survives in two manuscripts, in Italian and Spanish, both dated to the Middle Ages. It is one of the three works with Barnabas' name. The others are Epistle of Barnabas and the Acts of Barnabas, although they are not related to each other. The earliest known mention of the Gospel of Barnabas has been discovered in a 1634 manuscript by Morisco, which was found in Madrid. And the earliest published reference to it was in the 1715 book Menengia by the French poet Bernard de la Manoa. The gospel's origin and author have been debated. Several theories are speculative and none has general acceptance. Okay, the gospel of Barnabas is dated to the 13th to the 15th century. Much too late to have been written by Barnabas. And that's the same thing with the gospels, y'all. The gospels was written after the original apostles and disciples in another language, but they still accept that. And also, okay, this is much too late to have been written by Barnabas in the first century CE. Many of its teachings are synchronous with those in the Quran and oppose the Bible, especially the New Testament. Some, however, contradict the Quran because in the Gospel of Barnabas, it calls Muhammad a Christ. Now, I know what a Christ is, okay? A Christ is a savior. In other words, it is putting it out there that he was a messenger. And some interpret it as Christ, but we know from the Quran that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. However, even in your own gospels, particularly Mark, Jesus debated with the Pharisees on who is the Christ, okay? And we know the Pharisees was like the son of David, and Jesus went on and he disagreed with them. So you got to pay attention to the word Christ and what is it going into. We know that in the Gospels, they were expecting three people. They was expecting Elijah. They was expecting the Christ. And they was expecting that prophet whom we call the Deuteronomy 1818 prophet, which is the Gentile messenger, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Now, I also want to read how it claims that Jesus did not die on the cross. Rather, it argues that Judas Iscariot died in Jesus' stead. That means his place. Having been substituted for him at the last minute, this view has been adopted by many Muslims since the vast majority of them believe that someone else was substituted on the cross for Jesus. So we have Muslims who believe, okay, that it was somebody else who died in Jesus' place. I just read you a text from the Gnostics, okay, and Basilides. Now I just showed you a text coming from Barnabas, okay, that gospel. So right there, there is about three to four to five different things of what happened to Jesus. The Christians say Jesus was crucified. Basilides say that Simon the Cyrene was crucified in Jesus' place or another. Then the gospel of Barnabas says that Judas died in Jesus' place. And then we want to go to another view, okay? Now, this is the Quran's view. This is going to be Quran 4157. That they said in boasting, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, 
but only conjecture to follow. Conjecture is another word for assumption. For of a surety, they killed him not. So in the Quran, it boldly claims that Jesus was not crucified. So we have all these different viewpoints on what really happened to Jesus. And that's why I agree with the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that they did not kill him. For one, there's too many stories out there. You don't even know what happened to him. It ain't like Jesus wrote his own book like Moses. No, many people wrote forgeries and they wrote lies in his name. Okay, so the Quran is basically telling you flat out Jesus was not crucified. Okay, and we have no scripture coming from God Almighty in the entire Old Testament where he is talking about someone Who's going to die for your sins? This is completely against the Old Testament's theology. In the Old Testament, God wanted every man to die for their own sins. And this all came from Moses. Moses taught us. Let's get that. This is going to be Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. Yeah. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verse 16. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. Now, if we take that scripture and we go all the way up to Malachi, which is the last book before we get to the New Testament, which is Matthew. Here we have in Malachi 4, 4, it reads, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. So if the Old Testament is going to pass away and we're going to a new covenant, why is the prophet, okay, telling us to remember the law of Moses, which takes me to verse 6, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. So the hearts of the fathers and the children are going to be one towards one another because they're not going to bear one another's sins, okay? That's why their hearts are going to be turned to one another because of what Moses said. He said, the child shall not bear the father's sin and the father shall not bear the son's sin. So there we have all these different views on what really happened to Jesus. Now I want to go to Jasher. This is going to be Jasher chapter 9, verse 13. This story right here is remarkable, okay? It is entitled, Abraham thought the son was God. When I say son, I'm talking about the S-U-N, all right? He thought the son was God. The book of Jasher, chapter 9, verse 13. And Abraham saw the sun shining upon the earth. And Abram said unto himself, Surely now this sun that shines upon the earth is God, and I will serve him. So look at that. Look at that. Here we have Abraham thinking the sun was God, saying to himself, Surely. This son is God, in him will I serve. So look at these stories God put out there for us, okay? Because many people today, they believe that the S-O-N is God. They believe that Jesus is God. Now I'm going to ask somebody a question. Has God ever said with his own mouth, Jesus is God? No. No. He's never said anything like that. And here we have Abraham. Abraham was a truth seeker, okay? According to the book of Jasher, Abraham was a truth seeker. Here he is. First thing that popped up is what? Jesus. Jesus is God. That's the number one religion right now, Christianity, okay? And Abraham's like, hold up. The son is God. But let's keep going. Let's see what happens, all right? This is going to be verse 14. And Abram served the son in that day 
And he prayed to him. And when evening came, the sun set as usual. And Abram said within himself, surely this cannot be God. Wow, that is deep. He was like, hold up. The sun disappeared. This is not God. This is not God. And that's how many of us was when we were in Christianity. We believed that Jesus was God. Okay, but after we continue to study, we see that he's not God, especially that we had a Gentile messenger come on the scene. And he says, you know what? Jesus was nothing more than a messenger. He's Messiah, but he's not God. He's nothing to be worshipped. And so many of us were in Abraham's shoes. We thought the son was God. And then we came to the conclusion that, you know what? God is God. Okay, God is God. And I'm going to keep going. And Abram still continued to speak within himself. Who is he who made the heavens and the earth? Who created upon earth? Where is he? And night darkened over him. And he lifted up his eyes toward the west, north, south, and east. And he saw that the sun had vanished from the earth. And the day became dark and Abram saw the stars and moon before him. And he said, surely this is the God who created the whole earth as well as man. And behold, these his servants are gods around him. And Abram served the moon and prayed to it all that night. And in the morning, when it was light and the sun shone upon the earth as usual, Abram saw all the things that the Lord God had made upon earth. And Abraham said unto himself, Surely these are not gods that made the earth and all mankind, but these are the servants of God. And that's exactly what the messenger, peace be upon him, told us. He said that Jesus is a servant that he was a servant, that we are all servants to the most high, okay? And Abram seeing that the moon, the sun, and the stars are all servants to the great God of heaven. And Abram remained in the house of Noah, and there knew the Lord and his ways. And he served the Lord all the days of his life, And all that generation forgot the Lord and served other gods of wood and stone and rebelled all their days. So there is a generation of people who are truth seekers and we are seeking the most high God. But there's also a generation of people who are still serving the sun. They're still serving the creature. Okay, they're serving Christianity and Christianity. We have concluded in the house of David that Christianity is idolatry because we know that idolatry, according to the Bible, is when you serve something or someone like their God. Now, I want a quick testimony from someone who is brave enough to speak up and to tell me, what do you think about the people who are worshiping Jesus as God? What I think about people that think Jesus is God, they're they're just too blind to even understand and so stubborn to even hear the truth. Like, they don't want to accept it. Well, I think that they're too stubborn and they, like, they just like like to follow for what people say, but they don't even want to. They're too lazy to even study for themselves and find the uh, actual truth out. Like they just wanna, like they don't even want to lead their own path. They don't want to be the leader. They want to be the follower, which is weak. That just shows like a sign of weakness. All right. And laziness. All right, that's true. That is true. A lot of people are following the first thing that popped up, just like what Abraham did. He seen the sun and he was like, surely this is God. Look at all these Christian churches everywhere. I mean, this has to be the truth. 
okay? But Abraham came to a realization that I'm going to lead my own path. I'm going to be the father of faith for my generation. I don't care that my dad is not following the most high. I'm going to set my house in order that we're serving the God of heaven. Anybody else? Well, clearly, um, there's a, a lot of scriptures all over the Bible where it's clear as water, where it says um, that Jesus is not God. I mean, you got to be so naive not to catch it. It doesn't take a rocket science to see that Jesus um, is not God. Because um, in several books, Jesus himself says, my father, like the father's prayer. Like when he was praying, when he was away from uh, the disciples, he was not praying to himself. He was praying to the Father. So there's a lot of scriptures all over the Bible. It's just if people are stuck thinking that he's God, then um, they blind. They lost and they need to be found. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Well, I was just going to say how, like, to be honest, I don't know how people can even think that Jesus is God. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, for an example, like, I know God is not a man, but for an example, like, if a father and a son, right? It's like, like it's a father and a son, and then, like, all of a sudden, the son gets to tell the, gets to tell the mom what to do. Like, that doesn't make any sense because he's not the father. The father is the only one that's allowed to do that, not the son, because the son is just the son and the father is just a father he gets to tell his wife or yeah his wife what to do and whatever the son doesn't have like no like place to even do that because they're two separate people if you know what I mean yeah and also back in Genesis it says God created the heavens and the earth so how people saying that Jesus is the creator when Jesus only came into the New Testament Right. So Jesus wasn't uh, back then when uh, Adam and Eve was alive. So I don't understand why people is making it so complicated in their lives, thinking something that it's not. Yeah. There you go. All right. Those are good. Those are good. But let me ask one of y'all why you don't believe Jesus is God. All right. Because God is not a man in the first place. Yeah. It's that simple. God is not a man. That's the deception. That is the deception. Look all across the world. How many people right now are trying to be Jesus? <laughs> We got an African Jesus. We have a white Jesus. We have an Australian Jesus. We got a poor Jesus. We even have a Korean Jesus. All these people right now today are claiming to be Jesus Christ so that everyone can see them as God. Okay. Now, this is the reason why we will have an Antichrist because of the false teaching that Jesus is God is prepping the stage. Yeah, so you are all right. Y'all all right. Y'all all deserve a hand. So now we're going to be wrapping it up and we're going to be talking about how Jasher, which is believed to be the son of Caleb, he's bringing it out how Abraham was an idol destroyer. He destroyed idols, okay? And this is going to be Jasher, 11, 16, and I'm going to read. And Abram came to his father's house and saw 12 gods standing there in their temples. And the anger of Abraham was kindled when he saw these images in his father's house. Wow. Abraham was a truth seeker. He's like, man, the sun ain't God. The moon ain't God. The stars ain't God. The God of heaven, he is God. He is Lord. What's my father's problem? Worshiping all these idols. And we know that these idols that he had was one idol for each month. For 12 months, 
one idol for each month. And think about it. One idol was bigger than all the other idols. And think about what we do on December the 25th. They worship, okay, the so-called birth of Jesus Christ. That is one of the biggest idols throughout the year is the idol of Christmas, Jesus being God, a big lie. So I'm going to keep going. And Abraham said, as the Lord liveth, these images shall not remain in my father's house. So shall the Lord who created me do unto me if in three days time I do not break them all. Verse 18, and Abram went from them and his anger burned within him. And Abram hastened and went from the chamber to his father's outer court. And he found his father sitting in the court and all his servants with him. And Abram came and sat before him. And Abram asked his father, saying, Father, tell me, where is God who created heaven and earth and all the sons of men upon earth and who created thee and me? And Terah answered his son Abram and said, Behold, those who created us are all with us in the house. And Abram said to his father, My Lord, show them to me, I pray thee. And Terah brought Abram into the chamber of the inner court. And Abram saw, and behold, the whole room was full of gods of wood and stone, twelve great images and others less than they without number. And Terah said to his son, Behold, these are they which made all thou seest upon earth and which created me and you and all mankind. And Terah bowed down to his gods and he then went away from them and Abram, his son, went away with him. And when Abram had gone from them, he went to his mother and sat before her. And he said to his mother, behold, my father has shown me those who made heaven and earth. And all the sons of men. Now, therefore, hasten and fetch a kid from the flock and make it of savory meat that I may bring it to my father's gods as an offering for them to eat. Perhaps I may thereby become acceptable to them. And his mother did so. And she fetched a kid and made savory meat thereof and brought it to Abram. And Abram took the savory meat from his mother and brought it before his father's gods and he drew nigh to them that they might eat and Terah his father did not know of it and Abram saw on the day when he was sitting amongst them that they had no voice no hearing no motion and not one of them could stretch forth his hand to eat and Abram mocked them and said surely the savory meat that I prepared has not pleased them or perhaps it was too little for them and for that reason, they would not eat. Therefore, tomorrow I will prepare for a savory meat, better and more plentiful than this, in order that I may see the result. And it was on the next day that Abram directed his mother concerning the savory meat. And his mother rose and fetched three fine kids from the flock. And she made of them some excellent savory meat, such as her son was fond of. And she gave it to her son Abram and Terah his father, did not know of it. And Abram took the savory meat from his mother and brought it before his father's gods into the chamber. And he came nigh unto them that he might eat. And he placed it before them. And Abram sat before them all day, thinking perhaps they might eat. And Abraham viewed them. And behold, they had neither voice nor hearing, nor did one of them stretch forth his hand to the meat to eat. And in the evening of that day, in that house, Abram was clothed with the spirit of God. And he called out and said, woe unto my father in this wicked generations, whose heart are all inclined to vanity, who serve these idols of wood and stone, which can neither eat, smell, hear, nor speak, who have mouths without speech, eyes without sight, ears without hearing, hands without feeling and legs which cannot move like them are those that made them 
and that trust in them. Now, that's actually a Bible scripture in our Bible. Those who worship idols are just like them. Verse 33. And when Abram saw all these things, his anger was kindled against his father and he hastened and took a hatchet in his hand and he came unto the chamber of the gods and he broke all his father's gods. And when he had done breaking the images, he placed the hatchet in the hand of the great God, which was there before them. And he went out and Terah, his father, came home for he had heard at the door the sound of the striking of the hatchet. So Terah came into the house to know what was this all about. And Terah, having heard the noise of the hatchet in the room of images, ran to the room to the images and he met Abram going out. And Terah entered the room and found all the idols fallen down and broken. And the hatchet in the hand of the largest, which was not broken, and the savory meat which Abram his son had made was still before them. And when Terah saw this, his anger was greatly kindled, and he hastened and went from the room to Abram. And he found Abram his son still sitting in the house, and he said to him, what is this work that thou hast done to my gods? And Abram answered Terah his father, and he said, Not so, my lord, for I brought savory meat before them. And when I came nigh to them, when the meat that they might eat, they all at once stretched forth their hands to eat before the great one had put forth his hand to eat. And the large one saw their works that they had did before him, and his anger was violently kindled against them. And he went and took the hatchet that was in the house and came to them and broke them all. And behold, the hatchet is yet in his hand as thou seest. He just fibbed his father. And Terah's anger was kindled against his son Abram. And when he spoke this, and Terah said to Abram, his son in anger, What is this tale that thou hast told? Thou speakest lies to me. Is there in these gods spirit, soul, or power to do all that thou hast told me? Are they not wood and stone? And have I not made them? And canst thou speak such lies, saying that the large God that was with them smote them? It is thou that didst place the hatchet in his hands, and then says he smote them all? And Abram answered his father. This is the point right here, y'all. And Abram answered his father and said to him, And how canst thou then serve these idols in whom there is no power to do anything? Can those idols in which thou trustest deliver you? Can they hear your prayers when thou callest unto them? Can they deliver thee from the hand of thy enemies? Or will they fight thy battles for thee against thy enemies that thou shouldest serve wood and stone which can neither speak nor hear? Now, right there, that's the main point I wanted to bring out. How Abraham destroyed his father's idols, okay? And he literally had to rebuke his own father and say, well, why are you serving them? If they have no spirit within them, okay, if they can't talk, they can't move, why are you serving them? So that's going to conclude. We're going to pick back up with this story. There is still more to go in the book of Jasher. I encourage you to come out of Christianity. Christianity is idolatry. Now it's time for us to get in these scripts. Y'all ready? Yes.